What's up, y'all? It's Arctic Sun 15, and today's video it's another episode of J Reacts. And, um, hold up. Wow. First ever video of this reaction re um, series. I'm actually gonna, um, reacting to a Purple Tail. Not, not Purple Tail, sorry. I'm on Purple Worlds. Podcast. Well, yes, Purple Tales is originally it's that's what's originally podcast called. But this podcast, but the Purple Tales podcast, where mostly the mostly podcasts from Barney Ray, from Nancy J and Q Sisson, and now this is mostly from well Entertainment World, and so and K Sisson, Carrie Stenson is the only host of it. Anyways, I'm gonna re, I'm gonna react to. I think I'll do the part one or part two. Do two parts of this. Cause knows how much we, how long the video is, and yeah, if you want to check it out, it's in the description. And yes, the video it's called Purple Rose Episode Two, Ken Scott, which is I'm thinking he's, he, she's probably he's Raphael for um Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Anyways, um, hey on guys. If you guys want to see more more episodes of Chick Reacts, or if you have, guys have any requests for it, comment below, and probably the requ your request will be reacted by me. Who knows? It depends. And um, also, if you want to make also if, if you want to see more of it, or even you know, even if you want to see more videos of of me reacting to prolongs, especially Manchester Mag or even Chloe Glear Nine. Like I said, like, comment, share, subscribe, and of course, turn the notification bell because, of course, that's um to see for one of the first people to watch before any, before anyone else. If you guys have any thoughts on this video, comment below. And the shouts, especially for this video that I'm reacting to, is in Switch mode as well. And check the purple tails. <laughs> Why is it purple tails from parents? Okay, but I was trying to say that if you guys want to see. The DC Channel IK Purple Worlds podcast is in the description below as well. Also, follow me on social media, subscribe to Mystics, that's in the description below as well. And also, finally, if I forgot to mention anything during this video, like I said in other, other videos, um, check the description as well, just in case. Anyway, um, I think I'll do part one, but just in case. If, it, if it's part one video, then you can... This is gonna be the next part of this, so just in case. So yeah, I'm gonna do so first part I'm gonna stop on twenty-eight. So anyway, let's go right to this. <sighs> I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour, and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now, my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind-the-scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this yes. is Purple Road. <laughs> Welcome Jake, to Purple Roads. This is Kerry Stinson. I am so glad to have you here. This has been such an exciting project, and I am thrilled that you've joined us. Um, each week, we're bringing in some of my friends and guests uh, that I've met from my 22 years playing Barney the Dinosaur on the road and also on the TV show Barney and Friends. This week, I am so excited. We have got a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. So... With no further ado, we'll show the clip of Ken Scott. Man, that brings back a lot of memories right there. Oh, Ken, that. it is so great to have you. 
Well, it's good to be here. It's good to see. Uh, you know, I've seen this movie so many times, but every time I go back and look at it, it just reminds me of the moments when we actually shot it and what sure. we did and what went on behind the scenes. So, love seeing it. Sure. It's great to be here, Carrie. Thanks a lot for having me. Oh, on you're Roads. welcome. You're welcome. It's so glad to have you. Congratulations on your new book. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Teenage Mutant to a uh, Teenage Ninja to T. Te- yeah, you can give it a try. It's Teenage Ninja to Mutant Turtle, uh, Becoming the Real Raphael. And basically, this is the story of how I became Raphael the Ninja Turtle. And then all the crazy behind-the-scenes stories of what it took to bring those reptiles to life on the silver screen. Yeah, reading that book brought back so many memories for myself. Yeah. It's great to have a fellow costume actor. Yeah, for anybody that's out there that does uh, mascot work yes. or has been in movies or has worked at Disney or dresses like a French fry in front of a yeah. restaurant or something, we're all kind of kindred spirits. And when I meet other suit performers, yes. it's always like, hey, man, we got that thing. It's like, I know what you went through. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to talk a, bit, a little bit, start out with how you, because reading your book, you and I kind of have a similar journey that we got to, to to get to the roles we got to. So, how did you start on your way to becoming a teenage mutant ninja turtle? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna gamble that you and I started differently because I don't think you set out to be Barney when you were 13 years old. Well, that's true. <laughs> right. there, well, actually, there was no Barney when I was 13 <laughs> right. years old. But yeah, no. But you did not set out to be a dinosaur doing sure. your thing. When I was about 12 or 13 years old, uh, I was taking martial arts, and I was interested in martial arts movies, just like anybody who's you know a young kid sure. doing karate. I want to sure. go see Jackie Chan and Chuck Norris. And as I watched these guys on the silver screen, I was really like enamored by everything they were doing, not only from the 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 moves and the karate and the action and the fighting and all that, but just the fact that all these guys were like fighting for truth and justice and right. all that stuff. And ever since I was a kid, I've been attracted to like stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and comic book heroes and all that. So all that stuff about fighting for what's right and having the power to back it up really appealed to me. So as I watched these action heroes on the screen when I was a kid, Just like anybody else might decide they want to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever they want to do, I decided I wanted to be an action hero in the movies. And that became my goal. So my whole, like, adolescent and teen life was geared towards doing that. I I was taking acting classes. I was studying martial arts. I was entering in tournaments. And I was doing fight choreography and making my own crappy movies on VHS tape to try and figure it out. And then um, it just so happened, this all took place in North Carolina, okay. where, I was, where I grew sure. up. And uh, as I was in college pursuing a degree in uh, television and film, they built a movie studio in North Carolina. It was built by a uh, producer named Dino De Laurentiis, famous producer. Yep. And he goes all the way back to producing a Serpico with Al Pacino right. um, and Flash Gordon right. with Sam Jones. Well, he built a movie studio in North Carolina in order, because it was a right-to-work state. Sure. You could shoot cheaply there. Which, you know, same with Texas. Right. Same with Texas. So I went through a little bit of the same aspect there. Yeah, they're they're looking for labor where they can find it. That's right. Inexpensive production. Absolutely. So they were shooting a fire starter with Drew Barrymore and Maximum Overdrive with Emilio Estevez sure. and all these movies. So I would go down there during the summers of my college to try to work as an extra and try to figure out how to break into this movie right. studio. Because right. somehow I felt like my holy grail was on the other side of those gates of that sure. studio. So uh, by hook and crook, I figured out ways to try to get into that movie studio right. and meet some people. And eventually, I was able to get into the studio. Um, I met people that were in charge of casting extras. Sure. And they found out I was into martial arts, uh, started talking to me about a movie that was going to be coming there to shoot soon. And they wanted local people right. to be hired as extras to get beat up by the heroes of the movie. They didn't tell and, me... They didn't tell me what the movie was about or right. what it was called or anything. Yeah, you had no idea what this, no what idea. this was. All I knew is that there was a martial arts movie coming to North Carolina, my backyard, right. and somebody was asking me to audition. Right. When you look at everything I was working towards since sure. I was 13, this was like, it was just being handed to me. Like, sure. here's your dreams. Do right. you want them? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So, so anyway, I eventually uh, got in touch with these people. Uh, found out that the movie, the mystery movie, was going to move to Canada because of tax incentives and shoot there. So and did, did that just 
crush your dreams. It, destroyed, or, it destroyed me inside. It made my heart sad. Right. But it didn't destroy my dreams because I was on. I knew that I was destined to finish out school in North Carolina, then move to Los Angeles, go to Hollywood, and become the next action hero. Right. That was what my goal was. So I thought, man, before I even get to California, here's an opportunity. Then it went to Canada. Right. So I developed this real, like, deep down hatred for Canada for a little bit. <laughs> and then I got a call one day that said, hey, they're not going to go to Canada. They're coming back to the United States. They're going to shoot here in North Carolina. Would you like to come audition for this movie? It's called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I was like, wow, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles had only come out a few years earlier in the comic books, and it was had been a cartoon for about a year. So it wasn't the thing that had swept the world yet, but right. people knew about it, sure. and I had heard about it, but I didn't know anything about sure. it. Sure. So I... And did you go back and watch... So did you go find out about it? In other words, did you go back and watch do, the series or anything? I didn't do anything, anything Carrie. Okay. All I did was say, oh, you want me to come do karate? Okay. <laughs> you were just happy to be in a movie. Yeah, that was it. Right. So I went to audition, and and certainly there's a lot more detail that just these stories that are in the book. That sure, super sure. fun and Absol- entertaining. Absolutely. But the short version is I went, and there was like 100 other guys there. They were all auditioning to be extras right. uh, with karate abilities, martial arts abilities. Um, I ended up getting the role or getting the getting hired as one of the extras, which are basically the foot soldiers. These are the ninjas that fight for the Shredder, which right. is the turtle's arch nemesis. Sure. What was that process that you had to go through for auditioning? Because I remember you know, what mine was and what a big deal was. What was yours like? And who were you auditioning for? Okay. Fair, good question. I actually got the call, and I lived four hours away from the movie studio. Sure, it but was, you would have driven... Didn't matter. Right. I would have driven across the country. Yeah, anything. I would have walked. Right, right. So what they did is they said, okay, we want you to come audition. You got to be here like tomorrow at 8 a.m. So I was like, okay, no problem. Sure. Um, I jumped in my car, drove down there, and drove on into the movie studio, which was awesome because here I am at a movie studio. Sure. First time I'd ever been in one. But, but now you had gone to that movie studio before. Yes, I. When, when this I, was the first time you went in. Actually, this is the first time I was in. legally right. allowed into oh, the movie studio. Right, right, right. Um, a, several months before that, in in order to try to get into the movie studio, I disguised myself as a pizza delivery guy. <laughs> And I showed up with a couple of empty pizza boxes. Sure. And back then, it was you know it was it was before nine eleven. There was not as much security as there right. is and things today. Sure. I drove up to the single security guard who was in this little shack, and I, I just acted like I was delivering a pizza to right. whatever movie was on the lot that day. I just walked up and I said, or drove up and said, "Hey, I've got a pizza for production." And the guy checked his clipboard and he looked at me, and I was sweating like crazy. And then he basically just raised the gate and he said, "Okay, drive back here to the back lot. They're all back there, and go on." And I could, it was all I could do to keep myself contained at that moment. I drove past him, found my way to the back lot. They were shooting a movie back there, and that's where I met the people that were casting this okay. martial arts movie. Sure. So now cut to several months later. Yes. I'm about to graduate college. They give me the call. Come on down to North Carolina or Wilmington, which is at the beach in North Carolina. Come down to the movie studio, audition for the show, and we'll see what happens. So I drove down there. Uh, I saw these hundred other guys in their martial arts outfits all working out. And immediately, I get, I'm like, oh, I'm never going to be able to do this. Right. These guys are so good. Right. And we had to audition for Pat Johnson. Pat Johnson is a legend in the martial arts okay. and movie world. He was um, he worked with Chuck Norris okay. in the Chuck Norris schools in Texas. He was the original um, black belt instructor of all the Chuck Norris Tong Soo Do schools. Okay. And those were in California and all in right. Texas. But Pat Johnson is also known for a couple things. One is he's in the original uh, Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. Oh. He has a small part in that So that movie. right there. Yeah. And then in Karate Kid, uh, he trained Ralph Macchio and um, Pat Morita wow. how to do martial arts. And most people will see him at the end of that movie when Ralph Macchio is fighting Billy Zabka for the end of the movie. Pat Johnson's the referee with sure. the mustache who's like, go to your sensei sure. and point. No. <laughs> and, you know. I don't know. I grew up at that time. I remember seeing Karate Kid. And so I can just imagine that had to been really cool and you had to been a nervous wreck. Well, I I will say this. It was really cool. You're right. And it was very intimidating. Luckily, because I'd been doing martial arts so intensely, I mean, I was a very serious competitor. I'd done it since I was a kid. 
the training that you go through after a while sure. teaches you and conditions you to keep those emotions in check. Now, that didn't mean my mind wasn't racing a million miles an hour. Sure. But the moment as a martial artist that you slap your hands on your legs and you bow low and then when you stand back up, that's like a little bit of a physical ritual that allows you to center yourself. Right. So even though I was nervous and I was especially nervous because I felt like my, the dreams of my life were in balance <laughs> yeah. on this one yep. moment. And here I was auditioning for the legendary Pat Johnson who just like a year, a couple of years earlier had done Karate Kid. Right. The biggest, like oh. the best martial arts dramatic movie that had been made at that point. That wasn't just a Kung Fu, you know, action Well, everyone film. knows about it today. I mean, it's still, right. they've done a TV show, new TV show and the whole deal. So yeah. big deal. Movies like that have that lasting power because it's more than just a karate movie. It's a yes. real family sort of fable and drama and yes. all that. So, yes, here I am auditioning for Pat Johnson, super intimidated. I bow. And then what we had to do was we had to demonstrate our martial arts. Okay. And there were several ways that Pat asked us to do this. One is you do a, a what's called a kata or a form. It's like a gymnast oh, floor routine. Okay. <laughs> series of martial arts moves. It's supposed to look like you're fighting all these invisible opponents and it's how martial artists train. And it's and it's physically exhausting because you're jumping and punching and kicking. But so, I'm guessing at that time, exhaustion, I mean, you probably, your nerve, everything was so pumped up that you could have gone on for... They could have tapped my veins and made Red Bull out of whatever was running through my veins <laughs> right. at that particular point. Right. So I did my first uh, kata and then if, if he liked what he saw, Pat would ask you to do the next thing, which might be, you know, some people, if they brought weapons to use, a lot of martial and I just happened to bring some weapons. And the weapon that I specialized in was called the comma or okay. sickles, which is a, it's a wooden handle about 12 inches long, and it has about a six to eight inch curved blade on it. Okay. It's traditionally a farm tool that was used for cutting down stalks of grain or wheat or rice or whatever. Okay. So... Uh, I picked up my commas and I started spinning them around because there are these little loops of, of, of rope on them. I'm spinning them around. I'm throwing them. I'm jumping. I'm kicking. I'm doing the whole thing again. Boom. And I get done. And it was awesome. I mean, it felt great. My adrenaline was making me jump higher and kick faster. And right. Everything. <laughs> so now I've just finished my second floor routine, basically, and I am out of breath. My <laughs> stomach is pumping in and out like a bellows and I'm sweating the whole deal. And then Pat Johnson says... Well, I see you brought some nunchucks with you, which are the two sticks with the sure, rope yeah, in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd like to see you do those. So I picked up the nunchucks, and that was one of my special weapons. When I was a kid, I loved them so much. I used to practice all the time in front of the mirror, but I kept hitting myself all the time in the head and everything. So I used to practice wearing a skateboard helmet in case I messed up. So I, I pulled out my nunchucks. I'm doing the nunchucks. Boom, boom, boom. But without the skateboard helmet. Yeah, no skateboard helmet at this point allowed. So I did the whole routine, finished that. Now I'm just trying desperately to catch my breath. Right. And apparently Pat likes what he sees. So he goes, okay, now you're going to move on to the next thing. He asks one of his assistants to step up. And they start throwing punches and kicks at you, not hitting you, but just pretend fight choreography. Sure. And you have to react to the punch as if you've gotten you know, punched in the face yeah. or react as if you've gotten kicked in the stomach. Right. Now, had you ever done anything like that? The My, reaction part. Yeah, luckily for me, again, because I'd wanted to be an action hero and I was in love with superheroes and all that stuff, one of the things I loved as a kid was pro wrestling. <laughs> I loved Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat and all that kind of stuff. And so my brother, who's a few years older than I, uh -huh. we used to have a our own little professional wrestling league. And it was just him and I, and all we would do is we'd wrestle on our parents' bed or just on the floors, and we'd yep. practice body slams, and, and we got good at it. <laughs> we could look like we were throwing a real wrestling match. So not only that, but while I was doing karate, I was competing in tournaments in a thing called self-defense where you act like you're having a fight with somebody, okay. and then they give you a score of 1 to 10 to sure. tell you how good it was. So by the time I'm standing in front of Pat, I can look like I can get my butt kicked really well. So the assistant comes up, starts throwing some punches and kicks, and I'm flying through the air and twisting and flipping backwards and all this kind of stuff. And I'm guessing you're really exaggerating these, these movements. Yeah, big time. And, and, and one of the reasons you do that, actually, Carrie, is because... You know, if you're a superhero in a movie yep. and I'm playing the bad guy, if you punch me and I just throw my head back, well, it's going to look Trash like you hit me. Right. But if you punch me and I'm able to throw myself back through the air and flip and land on the ground and slam against the wall, uh, even though I'm the one doing all the work, you look like you're super powered. Sure. Right? So you really overemphasize this stuff to make the heroes look good. 
So I did that. Threw myself around like crazy because this was my this was my dream. This is my one shot right. that I thought I yeah. had at this moment. So I did it all. Uh, got finished, and when I was done, I thought, man, the, the confetti's about to come down. Right. They're about to hand me my first sure. paycheck and give me a dressing yeah. room. And basically, he just said, okay, thanks very much. Yeah. And that was it. And so yeah. I kind of was like, well, did I do okay? Did they like yeah. me? I was All my insecurities boiled up. I got back in my car. I drove four hours back home. And by the time I got home, this was before cell phones. Sure. I, the answering machine was blinking. I listened to it, and it said, Hey, Ken, Pat Johnson loved what you did. We'd love for you to be one of the foot soldiers in the movie. Come on back down on Monday uh, to get ready for rehearsals. We're going to start, and you're going to work the entire film, which is going to be like two to three months, right. and we're going to pay you the whopping amount of $75 a day. <laughs> and I was like, Woo! I did it. Uh, exactly. Uh, now, hitting that button on an answering machine, mm. it wasn't as simple as you, you were probably a nervous wreck seeing that well, flashing. Uh, yeah, well, back then, first of all. Because I went through that. I went through this same. I had the exact same thing. Right. You did it in my audition. Thanks. That was great. And that was it. And it was five days. I had five days later until I got a phone call. Oh, so wow. you were sitting all week wondering. So I, I understand it. And so getting that call and for you, that message. Yeah. Because you don't know what it's going to say. No, you have no idea. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, for a guy or a girl, it's like asking somebody out. You right. know, you got to put yourself out <laughs> yeah. there. You have no idea what's going to come back to you. And so, um, you know, that's, uh, I would learn later on, as you would too, that that's the life of a performer is sure. putting your heart and soul out there and, you know, dealing with a lot of rejection and dealing with some positive reinforcement too, mostly right. rejection, right? Yeah. Um, and you eventually have to really learn how to deal with that. If you're yeah. not prepared for that or don't have the wherewithal to take it, it can really defeat you and put you in a bad place and, and really ruin you. And uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Not only that, but you have to, to understand that you could have done the best – and it could be something like maybe you were a little too tall or oh. a little too – or this yeah. or that. So it's – it a lot of times has nothing to do with what you did. It's because they're looking specifically for something. Right. And you don't know why. You're just told yes or no. And you hear that a lot. Everybody says, hey, you know, my, my, the direct – you want the director's brother to right. do the job. Right. Yeah. No matter how much you hear that, though, it doesn't make it any easier. Sometimes it even makes it matter because it's like, well, wasn't I the best? Right. And now they're going to hire that person? So, yes, as I pushed play on that thing <laughs> and to see what it was, especially for that first – because you didn't know what message it was. Sure. And as soon as I heard, hey, this is the casting director, oh, my heart started beating right, real right. fast. What is it, Baba? Pat Johnson loved you. Come on down, seventy five bucks a day, and I was like, I just scored my first job out of college, sure. and it's being a ninja. So how cool was that? And it was seventy five. Probably, you don't even, you know. And I understand because same thing when I started, but I was getting paid to do what I loved. Yes, it was the Something money I thought was so much fun. The money was absolutely beside the point. It right. was terrible. The money sucked. Sure, but it was totally beside the point. Sure, I would have done it. I would have done it for free. Sure. for the opportunity right. and learning experience. So just to be collecting a little something to offset the right. rent I had to pay and stuff, it was fantastic. And that, that's how I ended up absolutely. being absolutely the, the foot soldier. In the Before movie. we go to that, I want to start back a little bit because I I think this is interesting how you got into martial arts. Right. What kind of inspired you to get there? Because I think this is a story you see a lot out there, and look where it took you. So what got you there? Yeah, basically what happened was uh, I was a soccer player when I was a kid. Okay. Uh, I was always athletic, always into adventure. I was wrestling with my brother, stuff like that. But I mostly played soccer. And um, I used to see at the place where I played soccer, I saw this. There was like a karate class that went on sure. that I would walk by, and I just thought it was kind of it, it was weird and cool at the same time. Sure. These people in their pajamas jumping and kicking. Right. I didn't think too much about it, though. And then one day I was in the seventh grade, and I'm walking down the hall. Yeah. Uh, in between – well, it was during a class, so the halls were empty. I was on an errand for a teacher. And out of the shadows from behind this locker jumped this new kid from school. And this was one of those kids that he wore like – this is back in the 80s or 70s. Right. And he wore like a black T-shirts and smoked cigarettes <laughs> oh, behind sure. the school with the other kids and kind of long, greasy hair. Sure. The look, the look changes, but we, you know, we yeah. all have that same jerk yeah. kid right. that lives around. <laughs> exactly. Right? So this guy came running at me, and uh, I don't know why he decided to pick on me that day. I guess I just happened to be there, and he was trying to look cool in front of his buddy who sure. was with him. 
But he jumped out from behind the lockers and he just came at me and he grabbed me in a headlock. And once he got me in a headlock, he did this pro wrestling move called a bulldog, okay. where he had me down in a headlock, but he basically just took a couple of steps, pulled me along with him, then he threw his feet in the air, and he just crashed down to the ground with me being in that headlock position, and he kind of wrenched my neck up wow. and slammed me chest first in the ground. And man, it hurt like heck. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah, it was really bad news. And and I immediately felt, it almost felt like a lightning strike was going through my neck and down my arm and this whole crazy thing. And he just got up and he was laughing. Sure. And I remember, I can't, it's so locked in my mind. He just looked at me and he goes, that's what you get. And he just ran off down the hall with his buddy laughing. And I'm sitting there on the ground, like my neck is stiffening up right away. Tears are coming into my eyes. Sure. I'm looking around. Is there a teacher? Is, did anybody? See? Nobody. I'm just by myself. Just got slammed in the ground. Right. Went back to school. I mean, went back to class. I'm rubbing my neck. I try to explain to the teacher what happened. I'm, I'm fighting tears. My classmates are looking at me. And it was just really a very low, vulnerable moment. Right. And for somebody that was so into action heroes and superheroes and knights and all this stuff, to get my butt womp just right. like that and be like so felt feel so pathetic it just felt terrible so i went home and i'm sitting around that night and i'm just kind of <laughs> stewing over it and i just was like i don't ever want to feel this way again and i remember there was this kid in my school bobby henrick and bobby had gotten in a fight or a scuffle, should I say, with some other kid like a couple of months before or something. And he was in the hallway and it was at the lockers and everybody was in the hall at that time. And some kid pushed him or took a swing at him. And Bobby just leaned back and raised his foot up and tried to kick the kid. And he kicked the kid like in the head. Right. And he, it wasn't perfect or anything. Bobby kind of stumbled back and, and he didn't knock the kid out or anything like that. But but that was the end of the conflict. Like sure. he showed the kid, bam, he kicked him in the head right. and fell back. And I remembered that, and I thought, man, I wish I could have done that to that jerk that jumped out at me. So at that particular moment, I decided I wanted to take karate. I thought, this is what I wanted to do. I've seen it. I saw what Bobby did. I don't want to feel like that again. I'm going to do it. So the first thing I did is I went to the library, got a book on karate, went in my backyard. I took my shoes off, and I opened the book, and I put a couple bricks on it to hold it open, which I'm sure the librarians don't want to hear. And I laid it on top of a trash can. Oh, the librarians are thrilled with what you ended up. Yeah, yeah, where, right. Where it got you, it's okay yes. that the bricks were on that book. So kids, go to your local public <laughs> library. It'll change your life. Yes, yes. So I'm sitting out in the backyard, and I'm learning how to do a horse stance and a reverse punch. Right. And just some super basic moves. But you can only learn so much, right? Sure. It's, it's like learning how to swim from a well, book. Oh, sure. So, and you're not sure if you're doing the right technique. and Right. You, you know what the picture looks like, but you don't know if you're moving right, right. to get there. Right. So I went to my dad and I said, hey, dad, I want to take karate. And if you can sign me up for the same class that Bobby Henrik's in, it's only 15 bucks a month. It's at the community center. And I really want to do it. And my dad was like, well, you know, this is going to be just like the model rockets and the model sure. trains. And just like sure. kids, you, yeah. you do something for a little while, you lose interest on the next sure. thing. So he made a deal with me. He said, I'll pay the $15 a month. I mean, 15 bucks a month. It worked out to about a buck 88 per karate class, right. which is a really good deal. Yeah. Um, he said, I'll pay for it. But if you quit, you have to pay me for every month that I paid for up till you quit. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. No problem. I, I love that. Yeah. I so, love that to see how dedicated you are because that's exactly what kids do. Yeah. <laughs> trying to figure out their way and trying different – I. I love that. So I got started. Turns out my instructor was a very respected martial artist um, who's still in my life and still a mentor to me today. And uh, just the quality of education and learning that I got by starting with him, it was worth every dollar eighty-eight we paid for every class. And I never, I did it. Uh, today, it's now forty years later, and I still wonder if I ever have to pay my dad back if I stop working out. <laughs> it sounds like you're never going to stop. It's just part of you, and then you're heart and soul yeah i it is it's probably the single most influential factor in my life is martial arts it it opened my first of all it it, it taught me confidence and self-defense and physicality and i competed and I, sure just everything but then the philosophical and the mental side of things that you don't know right away right but as you train over the years become apparent to you and then studying and training and traveling and with everybody else um it, oh it's a huge God. part of my life that still guides pretty much everything i do that's awesome so we get 
got hired. We're on the movie. How did we? How did we get? Because I know it's. You started out. It's the Foot Clan, right? Foot Soldier, yep. Foot Soldier. And then Raphael, I know everyone wants to hear. How did we become well, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? For those that know the movie, and I don't know, we can check. Do we have the clip of the... Well, we do have, yeah. the, we do have a clip of the Foot Soldier. Let's so, show that. So, yeah, so basically what happened was I was hired to be a Foot Soldier. Okay. And um, there, were, there was all these other Foot Soldiers on the movie as well. Yep. And as we were choreographing the fights... And, and we're going to start showing it here yeah. as we're going... As oh, we're okay. choreographing the fights, you'll see all these different foot soldiers. Well, this is me diving through the windows, breaking through the door. That's me swinging through the windows and the glass. And then my best part that most people know is this foot soldier right here doing the nunchucks. That's actually me reprising the nunchucks that I did in my audition for oh, Pat Johnson. Very cool. Now this is and this is the first one. Yeah, this is the first Ninja Turtle movie. And what's funny is the guy that's playing Michelangelo is pretty good at doing nunchucks. But he's wearing a turtle suit, so he's kind of encumbered. Right. It's hard for him to do fancy moves. Sure. I'm able to do a whole lot of stuff. Well, the producers were like they actually got concerned when we were shooting. They said the ninja's too good. The Ninja Turtle needs to look better. Right. So they jerry rigged. This is not in the script. They created this power drill with a clutch cable that was able to do this propeller move wow. right here because they thought that would be a great way to punctuate the scene and show how great the Ninja Turtle was. Oh, that's great. So I started as a foot soldier okay. and be doing all this fighting sure. and everything like that. And there's no Raphael in this scene because Raphael just got beat up in the previous moment okay. and then uh, uh, was now unconscious in the scene. And then what happened was during the movie, there's a scene in the movie where Casey Jones, who's the vigilante that works with the turtles, okay, he meets Raphael in Central Park. They get in a little fight, and Casey Jones pulls out a cricket bat. All right. And uh, uh, Raphael goes, cricket? you got to understand what a crumpet is to know what cricket is. <laughs> well, he gets hit by this cricket bat, and he flies through the air, and he just crashes, bam, right into the trash can. Right. And then Casey Jones gets away. Well, when they took the stunt man that was playing Raphael for that scene yep. and dropped him into the trash can, when he hit the ground, the turtle head came down real hard and broke his nose. Oh, wow. And so from that moment forward, the stunt performer could no longer wear the turtle outfit. Anyways, guys, that's enough for part one of this. Thank you guys so much for watching. What? Anyways, um, thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you guys will check out more videos in the future channel. Of course, um, if you guys want to see more videos of me reacting to Purple, Way, Purple Roads or Purple Tales podcast or other podcasts, whatever, um, like comment, uh, like comment, subscribe, or even comment below which you want me to, want me to react next. And hope you guys have a good day. Stay positive and stay healthy from this pandemic. And well, that's about it. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Mark Sofer Team. So I'm this video. See you guys in the next one. Peace out and bye. Your and keep moving as well.